Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us again. Uh, this is not our weekly Thursday program. We're here on Wednesday due to a pretty heavy snowstorm we're expecting um, tomorrow. So thank you for, for being with us. I'm Andrew Dalton, the executive director of the Adams County Historical Society here in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, it's great to be with everybody once again. Um, I'm here with my good friend, Tim Smith, my colleague, our historian at the Adams County Historical Society, and also my good friend, Dr. Benjamin Lully from Gettysburg College. He's a professor professor of anthropology and classics and was my favorite professor at Gettysburg College, I should add. <laughs> um, and uh, oh, someone's saying no sound. We hope you can hear us. Um, oh, I think we, yep, we just wanted to check to make sure we do have sound. So you might want to check your, your settings, whoever said that. Uh, if you can see and hear us, okay, if you could let us know, we just want to make sure uh, before we get too much further into the program. Um, but thank you all for being here. Uh, the Adams County Historical Society, if you don't already know, is a large repository here in Gettysburg with millions of historic items. We have photographs, artifacts, letters, diaries, everything you could imagine that tell the 300 plus year story uh, of this community. And we're very fortunate that Gettysburg is probably one of the most famous communities in the world. So our items, many of, of, of them here at the Society have national or even international significance. And as you might have noticed behind me, we are building a new headquarters for our history. Um, this is a, a rendering of the building. It'll be constructed starting later this year. And in fact, uh, the first phase should begin in the next month or so. Um, and if you want to help us with that tonight, you can donate. And we have a, an opportunity, actually a match of $500 for tonight's program. Uh, so anyone watching, if you hit the donate button at the bottom of the post, uh, it'll be matched by one of our volunteers at the Society uh, who's put up $500 for tonight's program. So uh, you can double the impact and, and support a really great cause to help us make sure that all this history can be moved into a building that where we can properly house it and have climate control um, and fire protection. You might see if you look around, we're in an old Victorian home with, with neither of those things. So uh, we appreciate your, your help to let us continue to do these programs and to, to build this new home. Um, and the program series tonight's actually part of a, a monthly um, series we're doing to highlight specific elements of our new museum. We're going chronologically from prehistoric times all the way through to the present day, each month showing you a different phase of Adams County's history. So tonight we're focused on Native Americans and the 10,000 years of history uh, that, that includes the Native American presence here in Adams County. I'm gonna let our guests speak a lot more about that. Uh, but first, I just wanna put one more thank you out there to the Dobbin House Tavern that has sponsored all of our programs this year. Thank you to uh, Jackie and our, all of our wonderful friends over at the Dobbin House. Um, and then just a little bit more about um, our featured guest tonight, Dr. Luli. Um, he's a, a Pennsylvania native, which we love. <laughs> And uh, he's done extensive research on Iron Age and Roman Europe and a lot of excavation, uh, archeological excavation in France. And he's also excavated sites here in Gettysburg and also in another Revolutionary War themed site uh, near, uh, not too far away, I think in Lancaster County, is that right? In York County. York County, okay, very good. And uh, I had a class with, two, uh, I think, well, maybe two classes, at least one uh, with Dr. Lowley. <laughs> a while ago now. Yeah, yeah. And it was the, uh, the I think, um, one of my favorite experiences at the College of Class is the archaeology of Pennsylvania. And uh, we looked at the entire archaeological history of all the different sites in the state and actually did some archaeology on the Gettysburg College campus. So I'm really thrilled to be here with two of my good friends this evening. Um, and I think I'll kick things off to Tim to start and kind of give us a synopsis of what we're going to be covering tonight um, and, and what we have here in the collection that we want to spotlight. Well, um, what's fascinating about our area is, you know, ever since there have been settlers in Adams County or what would become Adams County, people have been, have been finding artifacts related to the early settlers of this area. And uh, uh, I don't think a lot of people realize when they find these artifacts that some of them are thousands of years old. So if we just take, uh, for instance, uh, the idea that Native Americans have been in this area uh, for about 12,000 years and that uh, European settlers have lived in this area for about 300 years, um, Native Americans encompass about 98% of the total human habitation of our region, which is kind of incredible to think about. And wherever you go in the county, you find in fields and near stream beds, um, artifacts relating to these earlier inhabitants. In our new museum, we are going to highlight uh, 
these people in an exhibit. And also we're gonna highlight the items that have been found by people in our area over the years. Right, literally thousands of these artifacts yeah. that made their way to us, usually in cigar boxes or plastic bags. People pick these up off the fields and in large quantities donated them to us. And we're very fortunate to have those. Now, um, one thing is interesting about it is that most people think of the earlier settlers of our area um, as they, you know, know about the um, Native Americans from what we call the contact period, from the period from where European settlers first came to the area. And, you know, John Smith uh, uh, traveled up into the uh, Susquehanna River um, in the early 1600s, and a map was published in 1612 um, that sort of uh, of Virginia and Maryland and Pennsylvania and the Chesapeake Bay and the Susquehanna River. And it's one of our uh, early sources for information about some of the tribes that lived in their area at that time. And uh, this map is an incredible. It shows uh, lots of terrain features and um, it shows about 200 Native American villages by name. And it actually shows an illustration of the Susquehannock Indians on the map. And it actually mentions that they were a giant like people. <laughs> and so this is like the earliest illustration of some of the people that lived in this area that we have. And that's why it's used a lot in um, references. But this only uh, illustrates the last of the settlers that lived here prior to Europeans. There were lots of uh, people who lived here for thousands of years before that. Uh, and this is a color illustration that is sort of based on the illustration from John uh, Smith's uh, a map that's kind of interesting. Right. And is Adams County on that map, Tim? Um, you know, we've looked at John Smith's map and you can kind of see where Adams County might be. It's not to scale, right. but you can see the Susquehanna River and the area west of the Susquehanna River. And um, But uh, it's not, nothing is specifically listed that we could tie into our area, that's but it great. would be in the map. Wonderful. All right, well, now I think uh, maybe we'll dive a little bit more into the periods of time we're talking about. Uh, Professor Lully, do you want to get into this a little bit with us? Sure, you can hear me, Andrew? Yes. All right, well, yeah, and, and thank you again, Andrew and Tim, for thinking to invite me. It's always a pleasure to come and talk. Um, and so what I want to talk about just real briefly is, is, is this timeline. Um, and I have a caveat to say first, and then a brief reflection on this. And then I'm going to briefly explain from an archaeological perspective uh, what these different time periods mean to archaeologists. Um, so first of all, the, the caveat is that we look at this timeline and it goes from deep in the past to, to the present day. And, and for archaeologists, this is a certainly very typical way of representing time. For many of us in Adams County, this seems like a, a very logical and very natural way of thinking about time. And we might not actually even begin be able to to think about other possibilities, but the caveat I just want to point out before I start talking about this from, again, an archaeological perspective is that <clears throat> this way of, of representing time would almost certainly have been quite different um, and almost jarringly so uh, to the Eastern Woodland nations that have lived in this land um, for, for a very, very long time, time as we can see on the map. Um, and, and in addition to that, also, um, while archaeologists find a value in this, it's, it's important to remember that also even today, the many Native peoples that still live in Adams County, um, what we think of as Adams County, what uh, to the Eastern Woodlands uh, is part of Turtle Island. Uh, this is, again, one way of representing time, but it's not always the way that many Native peoples would have thought about time, where time would be represented in a much more cyclical way, uh, a much more experiential way. And so again, something I just want to emphasize before I explain this is this is the archaeological understanding of time um, that again appears somewhat natural today, but would have been very different. And so it's, it's an important starting point um, that archaeology tells one story about the past, but it's not the only story. Um, and so that's, I think, an important thing to say, as I said, this first caveat. Um, and then the value of this, though, at the same time, and Tim began to, to touch on this, is that something it, it teaches us and I think tells us today is, is this depth of time and how long humans have lived here. And as, as Tim said, uh, European settlers have only lived here for 2% of this deep time. Um, and I think it actually should and, and can give us a sort of sense of 
humility um, and respect for the lands and a perspective that um, ourselves have only, we'll only walk on this, on this land for a very short period of time compared with this, this deep time. Um, and, and beyond that also the way we live today um, in Adams County is very different from the way humans have lived with the lands uh, for a very long and extended period of time. Um, and again, I think that hopefully gives us a certain amount of humility and respect when we think about the lands and the generations that uh, have walked on the lands and that we're really only the last um, in a very long story. Uh, so with that said, uh, turning to the actual periods, as you can see, archeologists often will find the tools that are left by uh, native peoples. And again, it's a somewhat incomplete picture, but archeologists have broken down time based upon the types of tools that we find. Um, and this is that top line with the Paleo Indian period, the early archaic period, the middle archaic period, the late archaic period, the transitional period, then three periods of the woodlands, and then finishing with um, European contact. And this is again based on changes in the tools that we find as archaeologists, um, which tell us a story about how people are living. And again, it's one story. And in addition to this, archaeologists have also broken up this time into um, phases in the way that archaeologists have reconstructed how they're living. And so you can see in this earliest phase, uh, which overlaps more or less with the Paleo-Indian period, um, this is a period that was much colder and the terrain and the environment would have looked very different. Um, and the glaciers are still retreating. It's not until after about 8,000 BCE or so that the earth fully begins to warm and we enter into the phase that today we would call the, the Holocene. And so during this early period, the Paleo-Indian period, you have um, megafauna that aren't present today. You have American Mastodon, for example, in this area. Um, and people are living scattered across the landscape um, and they're foraging and hunting. And as the climate warms, we move into a new foraging phase, a hunter-gatherer phase, uh, in which we find a much more diverse set of tools and we'll see this. And seemingly people are um, accessing a much greater um, and wide variety of food. And then this continues into the period that we would refer to as the transitional period based on some of the tools we find um, where the, the practices of gathering food become much more intensive. And this will eventually then lead to what archeologists call the woodland period when again, we find um, new types of tools and, and, and new um, inventions such as pottery and it's in this last period where, from an archaeological perspective, we see changes in, in, in food procurement um, with the rise of farming. And uh, we begin to see sedentary villages and um, a, a great abundance of food is gather, gathered and, and farmed in the area. And in particular, central to this is what's known as the Three Sisters, maize, uh, beans, and squash. And we know in, during this period that Women of the Woodland Nations are um, central to village life um, and they're responsible for the gathering of the corn. And they have a very central life in both the, the economic and political roles of these villages. And then lastly, and again, this, this very small sliver of time, Europeans begin to settle in the Eastern part of Pennsylvania in the early 1600s. And it's around that same time when we start to see archeologically European trade goods start to appear. And then of course, as Tim mentioned, by say the 1700s and say the 1730s, European settlers are beginning to arrive in this area as well too. So again, the contact period, as Tim said, really is only a very brief moment um, in, this, in this deep time uh, when native peoples have been living uh, with the lands that surrounds us still today. That's great, all right. All right, so I think now, thank you so much, Ben. Yeah, that, I, I think people really don't, grasp how much time we're talking about. And uh, I think it's it's amazing how, based on the artifacts and the archeological record, these things have been broken down into periods where there are distinct characteristics. Um, now, I think what we're gonna shift towards is talking specifically about in Adams County, where some of these large deposits of, of uh, Native American 
projectiles and other tools and, and uh, pottery have been found. And then we're going to show you some actual artifacts and, and talk about their, their uses and, and how that relates to these, cult, these early uh, peoples and cultures that were here. So Tim, do you want to briefly explain kind of what, what the, the area looked like during this period and what kind of features the Native Americans um, were, were used to when they were living here? Well, of course, Adams County at the time period we're talking about was heavily wooded. And of course, we had a series of small streams that came, you know, came out of the county uh, into larger streams and then river basins. And, you know, uh, uh, those familiar with the county um, might, uh, you know, might know that we have two really major stream systems. And in the north and the east of the county, we have like Bermudian Creek, as shown on the map, uh, Conewaga Creek and Little Conewaga Creek that feed into the Conewaga and feed into the Susquehanna. And of course, both of those terms, Conewaga and Susquehanna, are Native American terms or, the, or terms that have come to us to describe Native American peoples. And of course, these streams flow eastward into the Susquehanna and into the Chesapeake Bay. And then we have a stream system in the west and south part of the county, um, Rock Creek, uh, Marsh Creek, uh, Middle Creek, um, uh, you know, and you can even see uh, Muddy Creek, Run in yeah. Middle Creek, uh, Tom's Creek, and they flow into the Monocacy River and uh, into Maryland, and then eventually into the Potomac River, and then down into the Chesapeake Bay. And actually, uh, we even have, uh, it's not shown on this map, but on the uh, western boundary, we have Antietam Creek that flows uh, into uh, the Potomac on its own a little bit uh, right, farther right. up. The but, Antietam uh, Creek, right? Yeah, yes. The Antietam Creek starts <laughs> in Adams County, or in the mountainous region between Franklin and Adams. Now, right. uh, e it's not, it shouldn't be, you know, uh, um, a surprise to us that the fields around these creeks are where a lot of artifacts have been found over the years. And uh, I think I have some of the creeks on here and some of the artifacts I just wanted to show. We in our collection at the Adams County Historical Society have, you know, uh, you know, hundreds, if not a few thousand artifacts that have been found and given to us in our collections uh, from uh, that have been found in our area. But there are other places around that also have large collections and there's huge amounts of private collectors that have found artifacts uh, in the area. So you can only imagine the extent of what we're talking about. But here's a, an older uh, photograph of Conewaga Creek um, in the eastern part of the county. And here's an article from uh, Gettysburg newspaper in 1900 that describes that uh, a lot of artifacts were being found since the early days of settlement in the area where uh, Big Conewaga Creek and Little Conewaga Creek meet. Um, and you can see from the article that, you know, they mentioned that thousands of arrowheads and um, uh, spear points have been found in these areas. And so early on, our newspapers are filled with articles where people are actively going out and searching for right. uh, these artifacts. And a reference to an Indian village or Native American, yeah, some sort and, of actual you know, settlement at the you time. Know, um, yeah. And early people realized that, you know, uh, early men had settled here. We went too far. <laughs> and um, here, here's a couple of uh, photographs. I want to show the uh, This uh, is a collection. Uh, this is actually a cigar box of quartz. Uh, spear points that have been found around Conewaga Creek. And I believe the, these were found in 1879 in the early 1880s, it says wow. on the top. Wow. And um, we have a, 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 another one I just put in here, just an example of the kind of stuff in our collection. And you might see from the uh, ruler that this is like four inches long. This is a, a, a serious wow. um, a spear point. Let's go to the next one. And again, I just threw um, a photograph in just of some of the stuff that's been found along Conewaga Creek in our collection that is, you know, it's very valuable to us when it's cited where the items were actually found. Right. And uh, of course, Rock Creek, you know, and uh, Rock Creek is called that because there's a lot of rocks in Rock Creek. <laughs> and because Rock Creek flows from the open plains north of Gettysburg through the area of Culps and Wolf's Hill, and there's lots, there's hills and there's woods and there's lots of rocks. And there's a place near uh, Wolf's Hill that uh, was identified early on as a uh, 
rock shelter where early Native Americans lived. And in 1957, um, some uh, citizens of Adams County, actually, I guess people live near Littlestown, actually did sort of a dig there. And they, in 1959, um, one of the state archeologists actually did a little booklet um, that we have in our collection. Oh, I actually have it here. Um, on uh, early woodland rock shelter in South Central Pennsylvania. So we actually have a little booklet that was published. And this is an article in the newspaper from 1959, highlighting the fact that early artifacts were found on Wolf's Hill. Let's go to the next one. And in the book, they actually show some of the artifacts that were found there. Um, let's go to the next one. And then of course, Marsh Creek. And of course it's tributary Willoughby's Run. Uh, just a, a massive right. amount of artifacts have been found along Willoughby's Run thousands of spear points were found uh, along Willoughby's run through the heart of the battlefield. This is a gentleman who uh, spent a lot of time as a youth uh, collecting uh, arrowheads and spear points and pottery shards and whatever he could find. And also, he, he also liked to um, you know, uh, purchase Native American artifacts from other areas too and had quite a collection. This is a uh, Clarence Swen. Yeah, um, he was a licensed battlefield guide. Uh, some of you know him as Swinney. Uh, of course, that was also his father's name, Swinney. And, uh, um, you know, I know a couple of his sons. His, one of his sons was a battlefield tour guide. So uh, they were uh, private collectors in the area. And our newspapers are filled with accounts. Here's a gentleman that uh, found a huge amount of artifacts near Biglerville. Um, and in the fields, you know, along, north along Rock Creek and north uh, up you know, along Willoughby's run. And he has quite a collection. And here's an article about him in the newspaper, um, I believe from the 80s. Right. Let's go to the next one. And then of course we have Middle Creek in, uh, you know, Western Adams County. And when we look at all the stuff that was found along Middle Creek, we have a huge collection that was found at something called the Wakert site right. in, along Middle Creek. Which is actually four or five sites, I think. Yeah, and yeah. It, all along the creek, there were yeah. obvious uh, areas where there were in, you know, habitations by these early peoples. And we have quite a number of artifacts that were given to us by a guy named Morgan, uh, the Morgan Collection. Uh, from along here. And you can see these are photographs of some of the artifacts we have from that area. Right. Um, and, you know, there was a guy named John Eicher who lived, uh, you know, not too far from Middle Creek, had a farm there. And he actually started a museum in his house or, you know, at his farm. And uh, there are several accounts in their newspapers where the Adams County Historical Society visited uh, his house, and I, I don't know if I, in this article, I, I guess I, this is another one, but it mentions that he had a huge amount of artifacts. And then I just threw this in here. Uh, this is from, um, I think it's like 1908. And this is on the Tony Town Road on the backside of Little Round Top. Um, uh, Mrs. David Weicker, wow. Weicker, and that's uh, for those of you who are into the oddities of the battle, this is Blind Davy's wife. <laughs> And uh, you can see she was digging a hole uh, near, a, near a tree and she found a huge wow. cache of uh, 68 spear arrow, points. arrow or spear points in one right. spot. So, you know, and it's not unusual that these things would be found. I think I have right. one more. I like, I was gonna say too, the, a lot of people think that everything is an arrowhead. Um, but yeah, the we're arrowheads, talk about and we'll get to yeah. that, but yeah. a lot of these are actually spear points. You know, they're on the end of a stick, not as a point on an arrow. Yes. So, um, for instance, here's a neat article uh, that's in the paper in the 1940s. And I find this interesting because uh, this gentleman uh, talks about he was in a farm. There was places where they were finding artifacts and he moved the large rock. And underneath, there were a huge, did he say exactly how many? 89 spear 89 heads. 89 spear points that he found under a huge rock. <laughs> and it's very similar to the article or, uh, we just saw before with uh, Blind, Mrs. Blind Davy. Right. And... Uh, uh, this is interesting. This article to me is very interesting because I went to this exact site where the, this mentioned this article and I myself found uh, spear points in this particular field. Right. And I also should point out for those of you who remember the uh, old National Park Service Visitor Center or the Rosenstiel Museum before that, all these artifacts were on display 
in the basement in the back room in the Rosa Steel Museum. There was a case and they had the big rock they were found right. under and they had all these spear yeah. points there in the case. Yeah. And, and we, I, I remember to this day, it made a dramatic impact on right. the exhibit. And if you look at any of the collections really of bullets and, and Civil War relics found around the Gettysburg battlefield, almost all of them have arrowheads as well. Yeah. Um, so it's just amazing that they were picking up almost in some cases, the same volume of arrowheads that they were picking up debris yeah. from the battle. Yeah. I think, oh, well here, I think, so now what we're gonna do the, we wanna kind of talk more specifically about the types of relics that we have, what their uses were, what we know about them, in some cases, what the material is composed of. And, and in fact, with, uh, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Aluli, we were able to figure out what some of these artifacts could be dated to, what periods of, of time, whether they're you know, transitional or woodland period or earlier than that. Uh, I'd say the bulk, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the bulk of our artifacts are from the archaic period. Uh, which is a, a very large, I, I, I would have to go back to the timeline, you might know that the, how many years we're talking about, but uh, that's even before, you know, we're talking thousands of years BC. Um, so let me turn it over again to, to Dr. Luli. Maybe we, we'll just go through and talk about a few of these different examples and, and what we know about them. Sure, and, and, and before I begin, it's always, I think, important to, to point out that um, one, um, and this is a sort of fundamental point for archaeologists, that archaeologists um, in terms of finding things that people left behind, we only find a very small sample of what people left behind. Right. Not everything gets preserved um, and not everything gets thrown out in such a way that we would find it. So obviously the things that archeologists find and archeologists are interested in, especially for this period involved the, the stone tools, um, very difficult things to, to make as I mentioned that are, are used and then are often lost or discarded. Um, and again, it, it attests to the long period of, of, of history of these peoples living in the area, um, but it's only a small sample of what they would have been using. So that's always important to keep in mind. Um, and secondly, then in terms of, and they're, they're collected and we find them um, and they can tell a story. And again, what's important to point out, archeologists can tell a story about this. Um, in the first nations uh, of the past and, and of the present and, and the native peoples that continue to live here today, also have stories to tell about these objects as well too. So I, I do want to emphasize um, that again, archeology span is one of the stories we could tell about that. And of course, as an archeologist, I'll tell you that side of the story. Um, so getting into this, as, as Andrew mentioned, I think one of the first things um, that's sort of a basic level is that we often tend to use the term arrowheads in a, in a, in a very sort of loose sense, uh, but we'll see arrowheads themselves in, in the true sense of, of a, a stone projectile point that's shot off um, from a bow on an arrow uh, is something that archaeologically we only find uh, at the very end um, in, in the late woodland period after about 900 um, CE or so. Um, in a lot of the sort of stone uh, projectile points we find, as Andrew mentioned, would have been more sort of for, for spears. In some cases, they may have been knives and multi-purpose knives um, and other tools. But we'll see the, the true arrowheads um, are actually much smaller. And again, they appear later. Uh, so here we can see it again, um, what we would call generically two uh, projectile points, um, pretty typical. Uh, these are uh, types of, of points that appear um, in the archaic period. And I think as Andrew mentioned, uh, it's by far during the archaic period from very roughly, um, and this is a very rough um, estimation, about 8,000 8, BCE to about say 2300 BC year or so. It's, so it's a very long period of time that we refer to as the archaic period. And, and that in itself, the name is, is odd and, and should be pointed out that it, it's in and of itself a somewhat antiquated term. Um, but that's the term that archaeologists still use today. And it's during this period that we see a great variety of the different tools, um, regionally as well too, um, and chronologically. The, the tools um, come into use and, and then disappear from use. And so, so these are pretty typical for that period. And you can see on the left, um, a, a, a very typical local stone, um, rhyolite. And on the right, um, looking at it, unfortunately, we actually weren't able to, to look at these all in person quite yet, but it, it looks like either jasper or chert. Um, again, locally sourced rock that's used. And um, Andrew, if you wanna to go to the next slide then, I think we sure. have two more. Again, two others, uh, rhyolite on the bottom right. And you can see actually then on the left, um, a quartz, a slightly smaller projectile point from quartz, which again is very common for this area. Um, and, and the native peoples are selecting for these types of tools, um, types of rock that flake off easily and that can, can, can maintain a very sharp surface. And um, 
another thing to point out that these tools are very difficult to make. Um, this is an incredible amount of technological sophistication, although we wouldn't necessarily think about it in those terms, but this is a, a true mastery and, and a true skill uh, that the native peoples had and possessed and passed down from one generation to another. Um, in that if, if you've ever tried, and, and I've tried and, and, and largely failed to make <laughs> these, um, they're incredibly difficult to make. And again, it, it, we don't, you wouldn't really appreciate it until you actually try, but it's very difficult to make. Um, and we'll see that in particular with, with another artifact. Uh, so here then um, are two examples of what I was talking about uh, with these true arrowheads. And, and you have to be careful that the scale, I think, is slightly larger in, in, the, in the one, the image might be zoomed up. Um, so but these are, are fairly small, and they're smaller than the, the projectile points that we just saw in the earlier slides. And then again, um, these would have been almost certainly shot out, um, shot off an arrow from a bow. Uh, and so they're much smaller. And, and they appear archaeologically uh, during the late woodland period, in wow. particular, especially after about say 900 um, CE. And I should say, um, in terms of how we know these dates, uh, if you're curious, obviously, um, and if you know anything about radiocarbon dating, you can't date, uh, say, stone, for example. You can only um, use organic samples for radiocarbon dates. So, in terms of how we know very roughly, again, from sort of Western reckoning of time, how old these things are. Um, oftentimes archaeologists, and this is the importance of context in recording where we find things, archaeologists will find organic material with these, um, these stone tools occasionally, and we can um, date the organic material, char charbon, uh, excuse me, uh, carbon, for example, say burnt material in particular, uh, is a good thing to date. And so that can give us a date as well for the associated materials from the same context. So that's, I should say, is, is how we know and how we have a, a sense again, in, in sort of Western reckoning of time, how old these objects are. And here we can see um, just a sort of a, a representation of a somewhat schematic and, and simplified, um, but of some of the steps in actually um, preparing these stone tools. And as I said, it's a very difficult um, process that requires a lot of skill. And you can see in the top left, uh, you would break off uh, an initial core and then take off flakes from that core as you can see in the top right um, with say a, a smaller stone. And that in itself, again, is a very difficult thing to master. And then you would start knocking off smaller flakes. You can see sort of in the, in the middle left, um, sometimes for example, with, with an antler um, or, or a piece of wood, it's something that it's a little, has a little bit more given it. And then you would continue to flake off the part, bits of the stone until you get the shape you desired and then and you can see in particular in the bottom image, um, you take a, a much smaller, say, antler point or something like that, and you would actually start to take very small flakes off um, to give a very sharp edge. And when we find these tools, oftentimes these tools were discarded, so you can actually get a sense of how they were worn down because they would be continuously resharpened. Wow. And here, I, and again, I think just, uh, a really interesting, um, this is something that always stuck out to me when, when Andrew and I and Tim looked at these. Um, it just, and you look at the, the, the skill and the craftsmanship and the aesthetic quality of it, it's a, again, a very impressive thing to make. Uh, and these are called, in the archeological term for this is, is a broad spear. And the name itself is somewhat misleading. Uh, it's likely that they were used as, as kind of a multi-purpose tool um, and sort of a multi-purpose knife. It, it, it's, it's not almost certainly a, a spear. And we see them sometimes worn down so they're used for, for a very long period of time. Um, and again, sort of local stone on the, on the right, it, it, it's, it's certainly a uh, metal rhyolite. And on the left, uh, it appears to be either Jasper or Chert uh, that has actually been heat treated. So um, native peoples would often heat the stone um, to improve the quality of the flaking. And that would actually change the color of it and it would change the, the consistency of it and, and the quality of the, the stone. So we can see that in particular with uh, this broad spear on the left. Um, and we can see the very fine delicate flakes, especially on the left um, side of, of this uh, broad spear on the left, you can see these very fine delicate flakes that have been taking off. Wow. Um, so then in terms of other tools that archeologists find, um, very typical for the archaic period onwards, and, and again, very typical for especially sort of 
later archaic, when we find a lot of tools for this area, um, this would be a ground stone uh, axe. So <clears throat> it's not flaked off in the manner that I described before, but it's actually ground down to the desired shape. I think in a very elaborate process. Um, and this would have had a wooden handle attached to it. Um, you can see the groove right here where the, the handle would have been attached and, and then um, sinews used to, to, to secure it. And it would have served the purpose of an ax for, for various tasks, including clearing um, brush and, and, and cutting brush and cutting trees and other uses of an ax. And this is a good second, second image of the, of the same thing where again, we can see this groove where the haft would have been. How long would it take, do you think, to make something like this? A again, because it's ground down, I mean, this is, a, again, a, a, a major skill, and it's a, it's, it's a significant work to actually ground, grind down the stone to get the shape you want. Wow. And using grit and water to continuously rub it to, to, to get down to the, the shape you want. That's amazing. Oh, and here are some. These are actually from our collection. Yeah, and, and something, and I, I think we'll have another side of it as well too. If you look on the right, uh, so, yeah, and here we go. Also something we see increasingly by, especially the archaic and late archaic in particular after say about 4,000 BC is the prevalence of grinding stones of pestles that are used for processing foods. Uh, and again, um, this area is blessed with a, a great abundance of food for, for native peoples. Um, and, and they're using all sorts of different resources and food of course needs to be processed, sometimes ground up. Um, and this would have served the, that purpose. And then here again, and I keep repeating about the archaic period because it's the period in which we do have a significant number of objects. And again, the archaic very roughly say 8,000 to, to 2,300 BCE, very approximately. And this would actually be a drill. And so it, it's, it's worn down and sometimes they're better preserved, but you can see it's much narrower. Uh, and again, would have been attached to a wooden haft uh, to turn very fast and, and say in between your hands to, to spin. And it would have been used for boring holes. Wow. This is amazing to think about that particular item potentially being 10,000 years old. I mean, I just- uh, you, That you one's not, not 10,000 years old, but it, 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 right. it's, it's, it's but old. It, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it is just amazing. I think people pick these up still today in almost the same condition they would have been at the time they were used. Um, in, in BC, you know, <laughs> it is, uh, it's remarkable. I know, and I should point out some of these have been, uh, there's been clay attached to remold them into their, their full, you know, um, or original uh, appearance like this here that, uh, that you were about to talk about. Do you want to talk about this one? This is, I think, one of our favorite types of artifacts we have in the collection here. Yeah, it's a very interesting artifact. Um, and archaeologists have generally interpreted this as a weight for an atlatl. So an atlatl is, is a tool used to, to throw a spear and to increase the velocity and the range of the spear you throw. Um, and you, you can get, again, better velocity and, and, and speed for it by, by weighting down the atlatl itself. And Andrew, if you want to, to turn to the next slide, then I think we have a, an image of this where you can see we suspect that oftentimes these banner stones, and banner stones is, is, is just the term that's used by archaeologists to describe it, uh, we're again used on the, the atlatl right here, we can see it's used to again propel the, the spear. And again, at the end of the spear, you would have um, this stone point. Um, wow. And again, you can see the, the throwing motion of that. That's, and that's something that we've seen. Yes. Yeah, the technology so, there is just absolutely incredible. Um, and it is, you know, it's like you mentioned, I think for, we have a lot of people just joining us, the American Battlefield Trust just shared our, our video. So thank you to all the, the folks who, who joined. We've got over 200 people watching and um, we're going to um, continue to, to address this. But earlier we mentioned, you know, we just don't have these organic based materials. Um, so all we have is the stone that, that remains from this very sophisticated tool. And if you don't mind elaborating a little bit on this, uh, ben, you know, how would, how have archaeologists figured this out based on so little yeah, you know, well, the evidence from the, the, the stone that survived? Experimental archaeology is, is always a key and that many archaeologists have actually tried to recreate um, these sort of things and, and seeing in more recent times the, the tools being used in, in say similar ways and trying to recreate it. Um, so experimental archaeology and, and observation of, of uh, more recent times of these sort of tools and that's actually also true in terms of experimental archaeology with how we have a sense of how these stone tools were actually created as well too uh, because archaeologists have spent a lot of time and a lot of trial and error 
and a lot of scientific studies uh, trying to figure out how, again, these tools are shaped by applying pressure to, to take flakes off. Um, and, and so that's what we would call, say, experimental archaeology um, and a really fascinating subfield of it, of, wow. of archaeology. Wow. Whoops. I'm sorry. I went too by accident. <laughs> Here's the next, uh, the next type of item. I think this is more of a, a mystery, right? We don't actually know a lot about how, how these items are. I think we have some more banner stones, but are there also uh, gorgets on here, right? Yeah, and you can see that there's one, um, and I, maybe we have a, we might actually have a, another picture of this. Yeah, maybe we'll go. Oh, I, I don't think we might, we might okay. not with this. Um, they're called gorgets, and that, as far as I know, it comes actually from a, a French term, the gorget, and it refers to sort of a, a necklace uh, that's worn around. And again, it's actually a good example, of, and I think archaeologists sometimes have to be humble in, in, in what we can say and what we actually know is that um, there's so much of knowledge that's actually lost to us that we can say things, we can say a, we can tell a story, we can we can say things that are meaningful and interesting, um, but at the same time, there there's a great deal that we don't know, um, and, and this is a good example of it where we really have a very small window into the past into a much more complex um, and interesting um, history. Right. And so here, and we'll see another. And this is a re, uh, an illustration of this uh, during the transitional period. And, and this is something that um, appears only during the transitional period. So this would be called a diagnostic artifact. And, and I talked about archaeologists divide up these periods of time. Um, and it's a very typical archaeological thing to do. We divide these periods of time up based upon the artifacts we find, and in particular, based upon artifacts that only appear for that time period. Um, and these are steatite bowls. Um, it's a kind of sort of soapstone. It's a very soft stone. They're carved out. And um, we find them throughout uh, the eastern, eastern seaboard, including in, Gettys in Gettysburg area and in Adams County. And we can see a fragment of this. Uh, so we, again, it, it's not pottery. We'll see an example of pottery. This is carved stone. It's a very soft, sort of porous, spongy type of stone. It's, it's brought in from other areas, Lancaster, for example, Lancaster County. And we know that these types of bowls circulate um, wide for across wide regions. Uh, in some cases, it looks like they were used for cooking. In other cases, there's no evidence of cooking. And archaeologists have potentially suggested, uh, say, gift uh, a function in, in, for, of, of gift giving that they were they were given as gifts. They were exchanged. They were used in ceremonies. Um, and I'll say a, a classic archaeological thing is when you don't know what something was used for, you simply say it was ritual. Or, or ceremonies. And we do have some ideas, and I say that slightly jokingly, um, and we do have a good, certainly good hypotheses about how this was used. But again, um, something that archaeology is, we're always trying to find out new things and, and, and try to confirm our, our, our hypotheses. And here again, and Andrew, I don't know if you want to go back to the, the, the illustration of the sure. bowls. You can see there's a flange um, sort of handles on it. And then Andrew, if you want to go forward then. Uh, it appears that, that that's probably what that is, that this is uh, sort of the handle of it, of the soapstone wow. bowl. It's amazing. And then we also find pottery. Uh, pottery begins to appear in the transitional period, um, in transitional period about 2300, uh, to say 700 BCE. After about 700 BCE, archaeologists would call this time period the woodland period. And um, this is a period, especially um, early middle, by the time we get to the middle in particular, and then, then the late, when um, native peoples are producing a great amount of pottery as well too. And we can see um, early and middle woodland examples of pottery. And here's what a pottery shred would look like. Um, and it, it's hard to get a good sense of this just because it's the, the picture. Right. But this would have been a typical pottery shred that you would find. Oh, and there's the gorget. <laughs> yeah, and, and there's, there's another image of that gorget. Right, that's amazing. You can see the ruler helps you understand kind of what size we're talking about there. Not not a huge item, but possibly ceremonial, and it or you know maybe it's wardrobe related, or, or some sort of a uh, something on a uniform. Anyway, um, well I think now you know. Thank you. That, that's such great context, uh, Ben, for what the types of items um, consisted of that have been found in the fields around Adams County along the various water sources we talked about. Um, and now we want to transition a little bit to. The, the lore and legend that developed about these artifacts. Um, obviously, you know, being the fact that these were found in, in you know, such abundant proportion everywhere, hundreds and hundreds of, 
of spear points and arrowheads turned up along water sources all the way back to the earliest days of European settlement. There were all kinds of, of legends and stories that came about, most of them, probably all of them, <laughs> not entirely accurate or very uh, inaccurate, but they did kind of develop a, a really interesting uh, narrative, the early settlers, about how to explain all of these artifacts. And um, a lot of it's kind of based in the fact that, of course, European settlers arrived here in the 1730s um, into the 1740s and established communities. And uh, during that period and into the, into the 1750s and 60s, there was a lot of violence. It was the Pennsylvania frontier during the French and Indian War. There were raids and kidnappings and murders uh, perpetrated by bands of Native Americans and French soldiers um, on these early settlers. And so the uh, perception that was formed locally about Native Americans was not a good one because of their experience with these violent incidents. And so, um, you know, of course, there was also a lot of misunderstanding and, and a lack of appreciation for the sophistication of these early cultures. Um, and so there's a lot of, of negativity. The, the early settlers did not view Native Americans as a positive and productive uh, group and really didn't acknowledge that Native Americans ever lived here in any kind of permanent way. Uh, but there are some really interesting stories that developed, and I want to let Tim explain a couple of them. One uh, for our Gettysburg buffs that may be watching is Indian Field. If you've ever visited Devil's Den or the Slider Farm, um, you may be under the impression that it was the scene of a large Native American battle. Um, in fact, that's not even the site of Indian Field, and there was likely no large Native American battle. But Tim, why don't you explain kind of how these stories came about and what um, what they consist of. Well, I think one of the interesting things here is we're fortunate that this man right here, Emmanuel Paul Bushman, born in 1821, died in 1899. Um, he, um, he wrote a lot of articles for the Gettysburg newspapers, the Adams County Independent, the Gettysburg Star and Sentinel, the, the Gettysburg uh, Compiler. Uh, and during uh, the 1870s through the uh, 1890s, um, I would say that maybe I have like uh, 30 articles by him about different historical topics. Right. So he's now he's not necessarily a historian, but he felt compelled to write to the newspaper and give his recollections of early Gettysburg and stories that had been told to him. Uh, by his parents and by some of the elders that he grew up living around. And his grandfather, um, his grandfather actually owned a piece of land uh, just south of the Eisenhower farm along the Emmitsburg Road. But uh, he wrote this in 1880, and he wrote the same thing several times. Southwest of the now famous Round Top, there is a place called Indian Field. There's an old Indian tradition that there was a great battle fought there, which seems very reasonable from the fact that the early settlers found two kinds of arrowheads on each side of a stony ridge, <laughs> which would indicate that there were two tribes or two great nations at war. The loss was so great that it took this spot to bury the chiefs alone. <laughs> it is a remarkable coincidence that in the dim twilight of the past, the greatest battle fought on this continent by the savages and one of the greatest battles of modern times were fought on nearly the same ground. Now, you might know, uh, I wrote a book called Devil's Den and in the book I have a little chapter about uh, Native Americans and about some of the artifacts that were found uh, south uh, of Gettysburg on the Gettysburg battlefield. And there's a couple of things that I think I should mention. Um, uh, I thought that when I wrote the chapter that everyone would understand that this Indian field idea was not true, that it was a myth. But time and again, people have read my chapter and then come up to me and ask me where Indian field is or <laughs> ask me about this great battle. And I guess I should have made myself more clear in that section of the book. There is no Indian battle. There is no Indian field. Basically, there was a cleared field and they found artifacts there because the field was clear. <laughs> and then as the early settlers cleared more land and took more trees down and made more fields, 
more artifacts were found in the area around that field and in every area that was cleared around that area. So what ends up happening, uh, Bushman is very specific about where Indian Field is. He's very specific in all his articles about it. It's west of the Emmitsburg Road, south of where the current Eisenhower Farm is located. It is not below the base of Big Round Top of the Slider Farm. It is not at Devil's Den. He tells you exactly where he says this field is, but that hasn't stopped people. I think <laughs> in the 1920s and 30s, people started to suggest it was at the Slider Farm or it was at near Devil's Den, and it just got way out of hand. And now people think there's this one little small spot that we find artifacts, but in reality, they were found everywhere. And right. what's interesting about this, and uh, Ben, I, I like his thought on it, this, this statement that is repeated by a lot of people is very fascinating to me. And it's, um, it's um, two kinds of ar arrows on each side of a stony ridge. Now, I think maybe archeologists today, if they found uh, an area separated by a few hundred yards and there were two different types of artifacts being found, they might come to the conclusion that this was two different periods of settlement near the same spot and not two different tries that were throwing arrows back and forth at each other <laughs> or spears. But uh, I find it interesting. Should, should we go on a bit? You yeah. don't have to answer that, Ben, I'm sure. No, I, I would concur that I, I think the more likely answer is, is that it's potentially two different time periods. Right. Uh, so we can say there is no Indian field on the Gettysburg battlefield. There is no Indian field. Right. It's, you know, for those of you the who... place he's describing as Indian field is west right. of the Emmitsburg Road, right. south of the Eisenhower Farm. Right. But then um, then what happens is we have really interesting uh, articles. People start taking interest in this uh, field early on. And this is an article from 1869 that describes um, an archeological survey of the area south of Gettysburg for these so, RE artifacts. Very so unofficial survey. It's yeah. interesting. <laughs> oh, these, I think are, at their time, these are professionals. Let's go to the next one. And in 1869, a booklet was published by, is it the Star and Sentinel? Yeah, yeah. the Gettysburg Star and Sentinel. 1869, we have original copy of this remarkable book in our collection. And it describes the artifacts that we're talking about. And in it, um, there's an interesting passage I want you to see that's the obvious conclusion from all the archeological evidence. Ben might be interested in this, that this is obviously part of a Northern Aztec empire. <laughs> and in one article, Emmanuel Bushman actually suggested Devil's Den was their pyramid. <laughs> and it somehow it exploded and all the rocks spewed out <laughs> over the ground. But you can tell that when you go to Devil's End, you can put all the rocks together and you can see how they've once formed an ancient pyramid. <laughs> so a lot of this stuff, you know, we take tongue in cheek, but it's fascinating, the rich lore and legend. But I wanted to point out another passage in this. And what does it say? The writer does not possess the requisite information to enable him to form an intelligent opinion. <laughs> then why is he writing a book about the subject? <laughs> That's what I would say to many people that have written about the Battle of Gettysburg <laughs> over the years. But that, that I love that statement in it. Let's get to the next page, because I think it gets really near and dear to Andrew's um, research, is that when they find arrowheads and spear points and stone axes, they the early settlers imagined that these were implements of warfare and not of peaceful settlers. Right. Yeah. You can see here, I mean, the titles are just, they're all focused on, you know, the, the violence that they imagined that these, these early peoples were engaged in. You see uh, battle axes, stone missiles, war clubs. And so there was this embellishment based on, you know, we think most likely because, you know, their, their ancestors had been attacked during the French and Indian War and had very real, um, you know, fear and, and lack of understanding of the Native American peoples. So that they attributed all these things to violence and in place of what we know it, it truly was, which is, you know, obviously the, the battle axes were probably used to cut down trees and the stone missiles were used to hunt um, and, you know, war clubs were, you know, who knows, they were probably the atlatl or something like that. So we, we know that, you know, these early 
uh, you know, groups. There were gab, you know, they were hunter and and gatherer groups, and then they were you know quiet fishing and and villages along the, the creeks and the streams in Adams County. Uh, we have no evidence to suggest there were these massive battles, and it is very interesting. There's also, I think, this burning desire to to tie the Battle of Gettysburg as some destiny uh, that there would be a second battle that would be the you know the 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 second yeah. the follow up to an earlier battle in prehistoric times between yeah. two giant armies. So don't this... get me wrong, <laughs> I love Emanuel Bushman and his writings, and of course he's one of the sources for the naming of Devil's Den too. Right. So, right. but uh, it's a little romanticized. Yeah, but it is. I mean, it, it's a way that they justified what they were finding. They were finding hundreds, you know, if not thousands of Native American projectiles and other artifacts in their farm fields. Um, and, and we still, I mean, I actually, I encourage anyone who's, who's watching, if, if you own property around here and have found them, we'd love to see photographs and learn more about collections uh, that we don't know about. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just a really interesting. I probably the only copy of this early book uh, that exists. It's the only copy I've ever yeah. seen of it. Yeah. Um, you know, and also I, I wanted to point out just as an example of what we're talking about that here's a 1949 article uh, where a gentleman near Aspers keeps finding stuff in his field. And um, uh, it mentions in the article that uh, um, he thinks that there was an Indian battle on his property because he's found so much, um, you know, so many artifacts. And, and right. I, I think that's, you know, that's, um, that's typical of, you know, finding things. Um, here's an article you may recognize that I used it in my uh, Devil's Den book. Um, I think it's from uh, 1908 off the top of my head, 1906, 1908. And it's a, a gentleman finding a stone ax at uh, Devil's Den. And of course it, you know, calls it the tomahawk, which, you know, and a lot of these things also, I should point out when Andrew was just talking about the time period, keep in mind, you know, we're talking about these things being printed in the 1860s to the 1880s. And, you know, Little Bighorn is 1876. Right. So there's a lot of violence in the Western United States at that time. Right. And I, I imagine to a lot of people, the Native Americans lived in our area are just an extension of the Native Americans that lived in the Western United States are all, you know, Native Americans. Right. Yeah. No, and there's a lot of feelings about that. There's also everything we've read, I think, about Native Americans in Adams County, um, the the settlers and the early historians went to great lengths to say that there were no real settlements. The Native Americans never lived here, that they were never kicked out of their land, that, you know, the, and it's true that when the first settlers arrived, there was very little interaction. There weren't, you know, large settlements of Native Americans in Adams County at that time. They had mostly left the area due to, you know, uh, tribal conflict and due to disease and, and European arrival further east. Um, so there wasn't a lot of contact right away um, or, or really at all. Um, once they the European settlers arrived, um, but you know because of that they really had no they, they had no way to really understand the Native American people that had been there and the idea that there were no permanent settlements I think is also really just interesting because you know if you take ten thousand years of history what is a permanent settlement and we've been here for three hundred years there could have easily been uh, hunting and fishing camps in the area that were here for twice as long, you know, the same families came back every, um, you know, to, for, to hunt and fish every fall or every spring. Um, so this is, uh, we wanted to end on this. Tim, do you want to briefly just summarize what, what this photograph is? It, it's a good example of, of kind of how our Adams County, you know, the, the, the earlier settlers of Adams County uh, viewed the, the Native Americans. And, and this is really have a, a, a very few stories of con the contact period. So, um, uh, this area we live in was settled largely in the 1730s and 40s by Scotch Irish immigrants and German immigrants moving out from Eastern Pennsylvania into our area. And at the same time, um, Irish settlers and other Marylanders moving northward into this area because obviously there was some conflict about where the uh, boundary would end up being between Maryland and Pennsylvania. But uh, the first permanent settler in our area the person who's given credit for is a guy named John Hansen Steelman, who was said to have established a trading post near present-day Zora in uh, 1719. Uh, also around that time, we have um, settlers moving uh, up from Maryland that formed uh, uh, the Conewaga Chapel, uh, you know, uh, Catholic missionaries. Um, and then, of course, we have some... Um, accounts or some suggestion that there is some 
uh, interaction with the Native Americans that were traveling through this area at that time. But by the time that the European settlers come in and balk, uh, there is really no interaction with the uh, these peoples. Now, right. when they find their first settlers find something, you know, left behind, you know, they probably don't know that it's thousands of years old. They probably think it's, you know, decades older to, right. from the people that just left. Right, right. And this monument was put up um, in, in this the monument early was 1900s. placed here. Um, oh, I forget. It's funny. 19, I forget the time. 1920s. In 19, 1920s. Yeah. It's a, um, maybe it's 1921, 1922. Right. It's uh, out at the intersection of uh, Topper Road, Petra Road, <laughs> Crumb Road, and Stillman Marker Road. It's at a four-way <laughs> intersection. It's pretty good. And um, al although the <laughs> monument has been replaced by a more modern plaque, it's at the same site. And this is, uh, you know, uh, said to be near where this gentleman, uh, John Hanson Steelman, had a trading post. Right. And the monument was largely placed by uh, Albert Cook Myers, who was born in Adams County, was a uh, uh, just an excellent early uh, Pennsylvania historian, wrote a book on William Penn, wrote a book about um, uh, some of the early settlers here. And uh, the dedication ceremony here uh, actually um, uh, features a Native American who right. was actually a Pennsylvanian that happened to be passing he through is. the area and showed yeah. up for the monument He's a dedication. chief uh, Pennsylvania uh, Native American from the Philadelphia area who um, was invited to attend the ceremony on behalf of you know, the, the Native Americans who had supposedly interacted and, and had uh, trade relationships with Steelman. So this is a really interesting photograph, um, although that Native American I'm sure does not resemble at all any of the Native Americans that we know to have lived here uh, in the thousands of years prior to 17, 20, and 30. Uh, but it is an interesting representation of how, you know, by that point, by the 1920s, our, our local residents were a little bit more willing to embrace the Native American history um, and include that perspective. And we're trying to do the same thing by, in our new museum, making sure that we pay tribute to the, the long history um, before European settlement with some of these fascinating artifacts that we have here in the collection. I should point out that the girl next to the monument is Nancy Keith, I think her name is. And uh, she, for many years, lived on Broadway, I believe, in Gettysburg. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's a beautiful photograph. And, uh, um, and this is a really interesting topic to us because we have all these artifacts and we're very thankful um, to have had Dr. Uh, Luli here from the college to help us understand the uses and, and the uh, cultural significance of, of some of these, these early communities. And we don't know a lot because there's no written record, but what we do know from archeology span um, is extremely important. And, and as, as, as Ben mentioned earlier, it's important to recognize the, the perspective of the Native Americans who are still living around the country and, and how they, they view and understand their own history. I mean, we wanna make sure that, that, that that's a part of our story here in Adams County as well. Um, and I should note the last thing I wanna say about this collection, uh, I know we're a little bit over on time, but uh, these thousands of, of arrowheads we have are currently out in our storage facility. We have not seen them in over a decade. Um, and we're very excited this year to be starting our, our new building. Uh, the first phase of the building will be a warehouse where we can bring these items out of storage for the first time in a decade, open them up and be, be able to interact and, and look at these items. So if you wanna see the artifacts up close um, and help us get them out of storage into a proper facility, Facility, please consider donating tonight. Thank you to Jacob and Ray and Donald and Jim and all the others who, who gave um, during the program tonight. Your uh, donations are being matched as well. So it's a, a great way to help support this project and support our, our efforts to tell the entire history um, of the community, which is thousands and thousands of years. Um, <laughs> so thank you to Tim and thank you to, to Ben uh, for, for all of your, your expertise and spending your, um, your time with us this evening to help um, us better understand this period of history. And thanks to the, the hundreds of folks who were, are listening right now and, and enjoying our, our program series. We're really humbled by your support and your, your uh, uh, spending your time with us. So uh, we will be next Thursday. We're on Wednesday tonight, but next week we'll be on Thursday um, at 7 p.m. We're going to have a program um, I'll be joined by Jane Nutter, the president of Gettysburg Black History Museum, and we're going to talk about our, our new partnership um, with the Black History Group in Gettysburg and how we're going to be including um, a special exhibit on Black History in our new building. So uh, we're excited to, to kick off that um, initiative as well uh, with you all next week. That'll be Thursday night at 7 p.m. Um, so thanks again so much for, for joining us and for all of you who donated. Uh, we really are, are honored to be with you. 
um, and do continue to do these programs. So we'll continue to have a, a weekly program as uh, for the foreseeable future. So please uh, mark your calendars for future Thursday evenings. And thanks again uh, for supporting the Adams County Historical Society.